thank you for joining this uh, podcast that we have today. My name's John Hills, and with me I have Sampo from Columbia Road. Hello. And we have the rather big pleasure to welcome Sean Ellis with us. Hi, Sean. How are you? Good, John. How are you doing? Yes, not bad at all, thanks. Not bad at all. I'd like to spend today talking about the concept of growth hacking, which is something obviously that you came up with. I'd, I'd like to start talking about life before growth hacking. So could you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the world of online marketing, what you learned from your early experiences and how that shaped your thinking? Sure. Yeah, happy to, to jump into it. Um, yeah, so I, I got involved in online marketing in, in really the early days of the internet. I... Um, I had no marketing background originally, but I was based in uh, Budapest, Hungary, and uh, had moved there right after college. And my friend started an internet company, and I you know, originally went in as a, in a sales position because I'd been doing sales for a while, but um, we needed to grow the customer base. I'd invested in the business, so I was pretty pretty motivated to make it work and, uh, and sort of jumped in and, and tried to figure it out. So that was a company called uproar.com. I invested in 1995 and then the product was ready in 1996 and started. Uh, so I started trying to, to grow the business in 1996 and, uh, you know, kind of through trial and error realized that with good, good data tracking, I could, I could test small, figure out what works, expand that. And so we, we used a lot of data and analytics and ultimately, ultimately move from kind of buying ads to um, making our games more portable and embeddable on third party sites. So sort of the same way that, that YouTube grew and, and companies like SlideShare and, uh, and, and that, that company ended up becoming a top 10 website in the world in terms of total traffic and, and beat some really well-funded competitors. So that was my, that was kind of my foray into uh, into um, online marketing and a lot of the stuff I learned there it ultimately became part of my my growth hacking playbook. Uh, but interestingly, that the same group of people who did that company, we sold that company in two thousand one to Vivendi Universal, and then uh, and then we started Log Me In uh, a couple years later in Budapest, Hungary. So a lot of the same people and. Yeah, kind of t- took a lot of the lessons from that first company and and took it to the next level with Log Me In and Log Me In today is a multi billion dollar company and and that uh, I I stayed there through about two thousand seven. Fantastic. I guess those experiences that you had with those two companies were some of the things that led you to to write that blog post as it's known the sort of find a growth hacker for your startup back in two thousand and ten. Could you? Take me back to that moment and sort of tell me a little bit about what inspired you to write that post and if you in some way thought the concept would take off in the way that it has. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, kind of, kind of filling a little bit of the gap in between there. When, I, when, when we were filing for our IPO for Log Me In, I, I kind of looked across the, the previous 10 years at the two companies and realized that a lot of the success of those com- companies happened in the early days of figuring out, you know, who are the right customers? How do we get them to value in the product and, and kind of get, getting the formula right, implementing a lot of the analytics and, and those pieces. And then afterwards it became really executing, uh, executing a playbook that was, that was pretty well known. And so I realized that a lot of that was in the first six months of those two companies. So for the next, um, few years, I, I really said, okay, if that's the most important part, I should, I should focus on that part and I should try to help a lot of companies in the first six months so I could actually get really good at that part as opposed to, you know, in 10 years only having, you know, two, two times that I'd taken companies to market. And so that's when I worked with Log, uh, actually uh, Dropbox and Eventbrite and, and Lookout and a number of companies that went on to these uh, billion dollar plus valuations. And um, I, so one of the things that I realized though is that I, w- once I worked with these companies, I wanted to to hand off the leadership and growth to the next, you know, the next person who I thought was capable of kind of taking it to the next level and continuing to to grow these businesses. And originally advertised the position as uh, like a VP marketing or online marketer, you know, kind of more traditional descriptions, and found that I was getting pretty pretty traditional people, so people who kind of thought in terms of how you learn marketing from a, from a textbook. And, um, 
when I looked around at my, my own approach and what I saw at really fast growing companies like Facebook or LinkedIn or, or Twitter, I, I just realized that the, the fastest growing companies were taking a very different approach. And um, if I wanted to attract the right person to, to run these, these, uh, the growth at these businesses that I'd been working with, that we needed to really reframe the position around the skills and, and approach that, that had been proven to be more effective in, in fast growing companies. And so my, my idea was rather than saying online marketing should be done this way and, and this is how companies should grow and tr trying to do it all in the description, I would just come up with a new name and title and <laughs> um, then I could define the, the skill set however I wanted if I came up with a title. So I got, I got together with a couple of friends and just over drinks, we started riffing on some ideas of different names we could call that title. And, and we came up with uh, a growth hacker as, as being the, the type of um, person that we thought could be effective in that role. And I actually did think that it could be something that would, that would become a popular term and take off. And I remember one of the guys I was, I was with at that, uh, having those drinks, I, I said, I, I really feel like we can coin a term that becomes popular here. And he said, yeah, you don't just coin a term. It doesn't work that way. And it was, it was kind of funny because then, you know, within within a year or two, there was thousands of job listings for, for growth hackers. And so um, I think it stuck, stuck probably better than even I expected. Sure. Yeah. And, and here we are pretty much uh, 10 years later, I guess, still talking about the term. Exactly. Um, but 10 years is a, is a really long time, especially kind of in, in the online world. I, I wondered if you, if you felt that growth hacking as a concept will exist in 10 years time, or if it's going to be replaced by something else and what that might be? Yeah, I think, I think the sort of the name of what it ends up being might change because it, you know, it doesn't really matter that much on what it's called. But in terms of how companies effectively grow, I, I, I think it's going to continue, you know, it, it really hasn't changed that much in, in my entire career. It's just a matter of, you know, it's, it's, it's about rapid experimentation and using data and, and just understanding customers on both kind of what they do and why they do it. And then running lots of experiments to try to improve how they behave so that you can grow the business. So I think all of those things are really driven more by kind of principles of how growth works and I don't think those principles are going to change that much over time. The, the tactics that actually work for growing businesses, so maybe maybe Facebook won't be as important as a channel or Google might not be as important, but, um, but how you discover channels and, and optimize and maximize channels will probably be a pretty similar process, which in, if, you, if you actually really step back and look at it is – is based on the scientific process that's been around for for hundreds or thousands of years. So I, I think uh, I, I think that scientific process of analyzing and understanding and coming up with hypotheses of how you can improve something and testing those hypotheses and when something works, you do more of it. When it doesn't work, you you chalk it up as learning. Like all of those things, I think are 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 going to be pretty similar for for as far as the eye can see. Sure. Yeah. You, you mentioned at the end there that it's kind of a, a scientific process that has existed in some form or another for, for quite a long time. Yeah. And also the fact that maybe back when you started looking into this, the people that were working in marketing were kind of quite book or academically driven. Where does growth hacking sit in between the two? Is it more learning by doing or is it studying what other people have done and then applying it yourself? I think it's it's definitely both. It's it's learning by doing because every business, every every type of customer, every product is going to be a bit different. But you can get great ideas by looking at what other companies are doing. And a lot of times the the best ideas end up being not exact copies, but but sort of inspired by and then and then customized to your situation. So for example, I, I mentioned that uh what what worked really well in this initial um, game company uproar that I worked for uh, was was these embeddable game widgets that that just extended the gameplay across the web and really leveraged kind of the network uh, characteristics of the web. But that was inspired originally by kind of two things. One, I saw um, a, a banner that you could play games in. I think um, Hewlett Packard <laughs> created this banner where you could play Pong in the banner. And so I like that idea of being able to engage 
people in the advertisement, which, you know, we're a game site, so it made even more sense. You know, Hewlett Packard had nothing to do with games, so kind of borrowing that, but then also um, looking at uh, Amazon and the early affiliate program stuff that they were doing also inspired me, um, where we we paid out affiliate uh, fees to the websites that referred traffic to us, but it was traffic that converted and monetized for us, and then we would pay them out. So kind of combining those two concepts um, really really helped us come up with this embeddable game across all these sites that that helped to drive growth. So, um, but we would, we didn't know it was going to work until we actually tried it, and then when it when it worked, we continued to invest and optimize it more. Do you also mentioned that the um maybe the principles of growth stay the same and it's the tactics that change. Do you also mm -hmm. feel that the type of company that is doing growth hacking has changed a lot in these last 10 years? Yeah, I think I think the original kind of pioneers of of growth hacking were the companies that had to do it. So um when I talked about the ones that had inspired me like the LinkedIn's and Twitter's and Facebook, they they all have in common that they're sort of social networks in a sense, and um, that they they had these network effect businesses that really didn't become valuable until you had lots and lots of people on there, and they couldn't really monetize those properties until you had lots and lots of people. So they couldn't just go out and buy millions of people and then try to monetize them later. They they had to figure out really creative ways to build audience on those products. And so I think they pioneered a lot with, with what they were doing. And, but what you're seeing now is, you know, it, it shouldn't be something that just that only the companies that absolutely have to do it, do it, but really any business can, can benefit from it. Like, why would you, why would you just go out and buy advertisements and, and hope that they work? Why not, why not sort of test all of the potential areas of growth? So if you look at something like, um, a LinkedIn where they, where they, when you went and signed up, they, they encouraged you to uh, upload your address book and find out which of your contacts are already on LinkedIn and then, and then connect with those people so it would give them more value and give you more value. But then the growth opportunity there was, here's all your contacts that aren't yet on LinkedIn. Would you like to invite them? And you know, some people might criticize that as pretty spammy and um, you know, it, it definitely – uh, bordered on the edge of spammy in my mind as well, but it was it was a way that they were able to cost effectively grow that business without going out and buying a bunch of advertisements. And it's a lot more meaningful when you get over the course of a few days several friends saying, "Hey, I'm on this thing called LinkedIn. Uh, you should sign up for it too, so we can connect and stay in touch." Uh, you know, I, I think it was something that th those types of programs were were pretty innovative and are still pretty innovative and and. But it's not something that just social networks or, or network effect businesses should be doing. I think everybody should be thinking about what are, what are the most cost effective ways I can acquire, uh, convert, retain, monetize my customers. And the, the only way to answer that question is through a lot of testing. And, and that's, that's, I think, what differentiates really the, the growth hacking driven businesses versus um, you know, more traditional businesses where really only the marketing team is doing a lot of testing and everyone else just feels like my great product instincts are going to help me create the perfect onboarding experience. We're going to, we're just going to do that and we're not going to try to improve upon it. And, and, you know, I think most people today realize that you need to test a lot of different ways of doing things to find what works the best. Sure. Yeah. I, I guess another thing that those kind of social network effect companies that you mentioned have in common is that they were all startups at the time. And it's yep. probably a lot easier to implement growth hacking in a smaller company where you need everyone behind a common goal. But how does, yep. how does that change when you're looking at a bigger company? I mean, I think in your book, you talk about the likes of uh, Walmart, IBM and, and Microsoft doing growth hacking. But how, how do you go about implementing kind of a cultural shift in, in a company with thousands of employees? I think we're still trying to figure that out. It, there's there's definitely companies that are making more progress than others. So, for example, um, Adobe has has I think done really well by when they when they launch a new product, they're they're building a brand new team around a new product and setting that team up in the way that a startup is set up, as opposed to trying to just look like the rest of the organization. So they can kind of create a new culture around a new product. So that's that's one way to do it. 
Um, but the, but the truth is startups, as you said, they have, they have a huge advantage. They have kind of a blank slate as far as culture and habits, and they can really have a, a full team that's looking at growth and how they can affect growth where the bigger a company is, the older a company is, the more they have these siloed behaviors where the marketing team doesn't really communicate much with the product team or the sales team or the engineering team. And, um, and that's, you, you miss the opportunity then to think holistically about the customer experience and, and to run a lot of testing around that customer experience. So um, there, there's some things that, that companies are doing, but I think I don't think anyone's really nailed it yet and really driven that transition in a way that it, it, it can be the prototype for all other established businesses. Uh, probably, probably the most valuable thing that you can do is uh, identify a common metric that everyone in the business says, okay, this, this is the metric that collectively we are trying to grow. And it's not just a revenue metric, but, but ideally something that is more tied to progress against the mission or how we're, how we're really impacting the customer in, in a way that we, we as a business are trying to drive impact on customers and, and quantifying that impact. And if, if you can go through that, the hard process of coming up with a metric that everyone across different functions agrees is that this is the metric that if we grow this, we're going to make a lot more impact on our customers. We're going to be able to provide a lot of value to our customers. And ultimately, if we can grow value across a growing customer base, we'll be able to sustainably grow revenue. And so it, it kind of starts with, with coming up with that common language of what success looks like and, and a metric that reflects that. And in, in the growth world, we call that a North Star metric. Mm. Yeah. I, I guess a lot of that as well is, is kind of getting people inspired or, or motivated for something. And uh, at least the, the whole concept or the idea of growth hacking is something that has inspired loads of people. And I think a lot of people look up to you as someone who is a thought leader in this space and looking for future trends and how to do it right. But I was also wondering who inspires you when it comes to these kinds of things? Oh, I, I definitely learn a ton from from a lot of people. Like I, I think Andrew Chen uh, has, has written a lot of things that, that get me thinking. Um, Brian Balfour has, has written a lot of things that get me thinking. Um, uh, Andy Johns, there's, 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 you know, I, I think, I think anytime you can kind of get the perspective from, from other people, my co-author Morgan Brown, um, and then probably just even even better than than individuals who are writing just trying to study facebook as much as i can to figure out figure out you know how how has facebook been able to do what i could do in a company of of 100 people or less they've been able to do in a company of tens of thousands or hundreds of, i'm not sure how big <laughs> facebook is now but they've they've really been able to scale scale that kind of growth mentality and, uh, and, and just growth approach that's cross-functional and, and continues to be really effective. So um, that's, for, for me, it's really trying to look at w w who are the teams that have been able to really scale this approach and how can, I, how can I kind of combine what works for them with what I know. And most of my experience has been in that, that really early stage of implementing a growth process where you know, the, the company is just has just reached the right product in the right market. And now how do we identify the customers, acquire and convert those customers? So kind of working from a blank slate, building it up to 100 people, 200 people in the business. I'm pretty good through that, but I have to look outside of my own experience to really figure out how do you scale that to, to tens of thousands of employees. Mm. I, Facebook is a, is a particularly fascinating case for, for many reasons, I think. And I think yeah. I read uh, a couple of years ago, maybe something that Mark Zuckerberg always used to do. I don't know if he still does it, but he always mentioned the company mission in whatever meeting yeah. he was in. He kind of got it in. And I guess that's it goes back to the culture side of growth hacking as well. That if you can all get behind your what you're doing and why in the North Star metric, then it, it takes the whole company forward. Yeah. And I think that's I think of what I found is that it's pretty easy to get marketing teams excited about growth or even even uh, sales teams. But, you know, a lot of times the product team, they, they get excited about creating a great product. You know, they, they want to create the, the best product they can. And, and that's where it, it, sometimes it's a little bit more of a connection to say, hey, if it's a great product, but 
we don't really get anyone using it. Who cares if it's a great product? You're not impacting very many people, and, and in which case, it, it's it's kind of a wasted opportunity if it's a great product. So how do we how do we think in terms of great product and lots of people having a great experience with that great product and solving problems that really matter to our customer base and impacting customers in a way that we're making a super positive impact, and then ultimately trying to quantify that in that number. But so I, I think, yeah, the more that you can kind of tie everything back to this is the mission of the business and quantified mission is really this idea of a North Star metric. But once you have that, then then you I think you have people who are who are really motivated long term to create a lot of value in the business and and try to to drive a lot of growth in the business. Absolutely. So Sean Ellis could you tell me in your own words what growth hacking is? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I could, I could write a whole book on it, which I did. So, <laughs> but I'll, I'll try to uh, give you a, a brief definition, which is that it's, it's a scientific approach to rapid experimentation across the full customer journey to drive sustainable customer and revenue expansion or revenue growth. Sure. It's, it's a term that's very commonly used, especially in the world of online marketing. But it's also one that often gets misused. So yeah. what tends to happen with a lot of agencies is that when they talk about growth hacking, they'll talk about SEO and they'll talk about Facebook ads and they'll kind of promise you the moon within about six months. Is, is growth hacking something that goes a lot deeper than that? And what are people getting wrong when they, when they pitch it in that way? Yeah, I think when they pitch it that way, what they're really talking about is just good marketing, which is which is fine. Like if that's if that would if that's what gets people excited about their services, I can understand why they would why they would use that. But I think the difference between good marketing and growth hacking is that it goes beyond just the customer acquisition side, so just the customer out, outreach side, and thinks holistically about how do I take that customer all the way from consideration to actually becoming a, a really valuable retained customer. And so the testing goes well beyond what a marketing team should be doing and, and involves the product team and engineering and design and just testing all the way across to actually try to get people to initially have a good enough experience where they keep staying on the product and then and then ideally finding ways so that they kind of integrate it more into their daily life and, and continue to get value over the long term. Yeah, and if I may add, uh, I think quite often we've seen that, that like many, many companies see it, uh, growth hacking as a sort of set of tricks and tips and, and, and so on, and you do them sort of experiments ad hoc basis. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas I think uh, you, you really need to have, it's, it's quite a systematic and analytical process. So you need to have a, that kind of approach and measure everything and keep learning and improving and, and so on instead of this yeah. one of one of tricks. So how, yeah. how, how would you guys say that you manage expectations from the start with a client on that basis then? Is it to do with setting timeframes, uh, kind of resources required, things like that? I think we, we, we typically like time box, let's say three months. So you need a, enough time. Uh, you need to, you know, start small and, and start experimenting. And, and, and if you don't see any results in three months, then you probably, you know, need to go back, back, back and uh, uh, see if there's something that you need to change in the product or service itself or, or is, is growth hacking uh, what, what you actually need to do there. Uh, but but uh, we don't want to, at least as a, as a consultancy, we don't want to promise like, really rapid results and immediate hockey sticks because it's, it's about continuous learning and, and testing and validating. How, how do you, Sean, see like a, what's, what's like a reasonable time frame? Yeah, so I, well, I think it's, it, I think if you look at the, the big picture of what you're trying to do, that ultimately the goal is to get everyone in the company thinking about how do we drive growth and how do, how do we impact growth and then you know, from a, from an agency or consultancy perspective, it's it's actually really easy to add value by bringing a lot of channel expertise to the table. So, you know, a lot of times an agency is going to be way better at Facebook ads or SEO or some of the external pieces, and that progressively, as you get deeper into the customer experience, where you get part of that ongoing customer experience, 
it's a lot harder for an agency to run experiments in, you know, how, how do we, how do we drive engagement for people who are less engaged in the product or, you know, what's, what's a feature that's going to bring them back on a more regular basis or that, that sort of thing is something that usually a core product team would be doing. And so what I've seen on the, on the agency and consultancy side is that a lot of times you can kind of earn that trust by getting some quick wins on the on the channel side of things but you really have to have a plan for ultimately trying to get to the point where you're testing at all points in that customer journey and that uh, you use those wins to get more permission to go deeper and deeper into the customer journey for those experiments absolutely one thing that maybe people tend to gloss over when they uh, when they talk about growth hacking is growth hacking and fear and what I mean there is that it's a culture of experimentation. So you, you try 10 things, and the first nine will quite possibly fail. And it's maybe number 10 where you kind of you hit with a really good result. Yeah. When you're in a smaller company, you maybe don't have as much to lose as in a larger company, and you can afford to experiment because you kind of do or die. But in a larger company, you already have a reputation and, and you have things to lose. So how, how does growth hacking fit in? How does one sell the concept of growth hacking to a company that already has stuff on the table and they could potentially lose more if it doesn't work out? Yeah, I mean, for me, a, a lot of times it's, a, it's about just kind of educating people that even if you aren't enthusiastic about the idea of testing, you are actually testing. You, you've, you've just done one test, you know, <laughs> one test at each point in the customer journey. And, and the chances that you that you came up with the best variation on your very first attempt are, are it, it's almost impossible that that would be the case. So you, you already tested, which is, is what you have now. And now let's test something against that. And we don't need to test you know, a huge percentage of the audience on, on the new variation. We, you know, if you're a big company, you can maybe put 5% of your audience on something new and start to see, do they behave differently and, and create, more value than the people who went through the original flow with the product. And so it's, it's really a matter of kind of how, how quickly you want to get to a result. But I think it's that mind shift of essentially saying everything is a guess and that ultimately the winners are the ones that run more experiments and the ones that, that figure out if I, it, just as you said, if I test 10 things, one's going to be better than the other nine. If I test 100 things, one's going to be better than the other 99. And so you want to be deliberate about it, uh, but but ideally, what you want to be able to find out is okay. If I have if I have a hundred people who go from point A to point B, and then only ten people go from point B to point C. So let's say you know I have a hundred people who sign up, but only ten people who download after signing up. What happened to the other ninety people? And and can I do better than ten? And so. One thing you could do is just just guess a completely different way of of you know getting people to download the product, you know, or you can you can actually ask the ninety people who signed up and didn't download your product, why did you sign up and not download our product? And and you'll probably uncover some insights that are going to help you solve a problem that you know a fear whether that that fear is I don't think this software is secure or um, I you know, I, I think it's going to be too expensive or whatever, whatever the fear is that holds them back from taking the action you want them to take, then, then you want to run some experiments that try to address that, that the issue that's holding them back. And if you're, if you're deliberate that way and you're, you're using the data and you're using some qualitative surveying or usability tests or other things to try to diagnose the problem, and then your, your test is now a proposed solution to a known problem, the chances of success are, are much higher. And so I think sometimes that in a rush to run a lot of tests that people maybe aren't as deliberate in the beginning as they could be to run smart tests. And the fact is, if you run 10 tests and, and all 10 of them fail, it's going to be probably pretty hard to get your organization enthusiastic to run another 10 tests because it, it takes time and energy to implement those tests. But if you can you can really do your research up front, tee up those first 10 tests to really trying to address you know, problems that are qual quantitatively measured problems, like we're losing a lot of people at this step, and qualitatively, we think we're losing them for these reasons, and now we're trying to solve that problem. It's, 
I, it's very hard to not see quite a bit of improvement on your first 10 tests. Yep. So I guess on, on the one hand, you have sort of experimentation, which is quite a dynamic, ever-changing thing. When you're a bigger company, you often tend to have quite an established brand, which is something that you build up over time. I'm thinking of the likes of, for example, Walmart as a brand that uh -huh. is synonymous with certain things. How does, on the one hand, the idea of a steady, kind of ever-increasing brand concept align with the idea of rapid, ever-changing growth hacking? Well, I think, I think the starting point is, is if you're a Walmart who's got that great brand and you're afraid to start running experiments because you might mess up that brand, take a step back, look at what your market cap is, compare that to Amazon and realize that you were many times more valuable than, than Amazon only a few years ago. And now Amazon's many times more valuable than you. What are they doing differently? They run a ton of experiments. And so I think just at the starting point, like the, the value of a brand isn't what it used to be, that, that clearly an awesome customer experience is, is often you know, as powerful or more powerful than just a trusted brand. And so you obviously want to try to nurture, nurture a good brand, but at the same time have this, this mindset of th this continuous improvement mindset, this mindset of growth that everything we're doing, there's a better way to do it. And we just have to prioritize our efforts around those areas that are least optimal, those areas that, that need the most improvement. And that's where studying the analytics, realizing that you, you almost never have 100% of the people do exactly the action you want them to do, trying to understand the people who don't do the action and why they don't do it and how you can tweak that experience to get more people to do the action that's going to help them get more value from what you're providing. It's, uh, you know, ultimately, to me, it's, it's that the, the best brands are representing great customer experiences and, and you, you strengthen a brand by improving that customer experience. And so I don't think it's necessarily one way or the other. Where I see brand get in the way of the testing a lot of times is that they want to, they want to micromanage the, the, the brand experience of the test. And so as a result, the, the group can maybe run you know, 20% of the tests they'd otherwise be able to run if they, if they had more free reign. And that's where I think that what would probably work better is if, if, if the testing is done in a way where it's not exposing a lot of people to it, but when you find something that works better, then, then working with the brand team as you, as you try to implement that better way in a more permanent way uh, to make sure that it's, it's it, you know, on, on brand and, and aligned with the rest of the brand impression. But, but early on, I think the, the risk of moving slower to try to stay on brand um, but but improve a lot slower is just is not worth that risk. I I, I think it's 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 better to risk breaking things and moving a a lot quicker to to get to a more optimal experience. Uh, have you uh, have you experienced other kind of fears with the with the larger and more established companies uh, besides the brand like messing up with the brand? Yeah, I don't think it's as much. I, I to me, I think the biggest thing is just. It's just the the siloed habits of those businesses where um, particularly say a product team, most product teams think in terms of my my long term product where there's in in three years, I want the product to be doing all of these things. Today it's only doing this small set of those things. I wish I had more resources so I could get there faster. And so they're they're constantly thinking about how do I make the the core product experience better for my existing customers when the truth is that they can make a lot more impact if they if they get a lot more new customers to the right experience with the product. And so what you see, especially in consumer businesses, more and more Silicon Valley consumer businesses are taking core product development resources and allocating upwards of 50% of those core product development resources to new customer onboarding and trying to trying to get new customers to a great experience with the product much quicker. And if you can get them to a great experience with the product, then they become a long-term customer. And so finding a balance between making the product more accessible and also making the product better for everyone. And so you don't want to err only on the side of 
you know, make it accessible and so that you're not continuing to evolve the product. But most product teams way over index on, um, let me engage with my existing customers and try to figure out how do I build a product roadmap that will make it even better for them long-term. And, and they, they miss out on the 90% of customers who showed interest, but gave up because they, it was just too inaccessible for them. Mm -hmm. We've been also working, uh, with quite many clients do not necessarily sell like digital goods, like, you know, electricity contracts or recycling services or, or, or whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, uh, I think, uh, for, for us, it, or in our experience, um, uh, it's, it's quite sort of, uh, it feels safe to invest in, 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 in the product itself, but investing in growth is, it's, it's, it's much more like, you know, intangible. Uh, so if you invest X months of, you know, human time uh, for developing better products you can more or less expect what you get out from that pipeline but but if you experiment uh, in investment experimenting uh, in for growth uh, so by defini definition a b testing means that 50 percent of your investment will be sort of wasted that's a that's a good result of an a b test you you, you find a winner and you find a loser and, right. and and it's much more sort of it feels risky to invest in something uh in tan tangible and, and you cannot really like expect what's what's the outcome so those kind of yeah. fears are quite quite typical in in uh, more traditional companies at least yeah but i i like to look at like dropbox versus some of the other uh kind of cloud backup solutions that were that were were out there before where yeah you know, Dro dropbox i think realized that complexity is probably a bigger barrier to adoption than, than, you know, not matching everything feature for feature or being, being the, the most valuable free product, you know, or having the most space in your free product or something like that. And so, um, you know, I, I think just because you could add more to it, bloatware ultimately, you know, is, is not always more, more features is not always more attractive. Like an elegant solution that really exactly. solves a problem is, is, often more attractive. And so that's where being able to, even looking at core features as tests in a sense. And if, if nobody uses the feature or such a small amount of people use the feature that it, it adds unnecessary complexity for the rest of the people, it's better to reduce that feature. So I, I, I think that um, ultimately, ultimately throwaway code is, it, that is a hard thing for people to get their head around. And whether that's, whether that's um, a uh, you know a digital product, or I even look at the case of Apple, and and you could say Apple probably figured out the the onboarding for a physical product before anyone, and and they have by far you know from a physical product perspective the most valuable business out there, and it's it's because it's it's this amazing experience to unwrap. And get started with an Apple product versus most products just just don't even think about the unwrapping of the product. You know, they don't think about how how does what is the emotional journey that someone goes on to fall in love with a new product that they've gotten, and as a result, it, it just ends up in a drawer for a lot of people. Um, you know, for for a lot of kind of gadget type products, and so I think the lines between sort of digital and physical are blurring quite a bit, but even in a purely physical product, how how you introduce and onboard someone into an experience where they fall in love with that product makes a huge difference in terms of, you know, long-term value of the business and long-term impact you make on customers. Yeah. How, how would you say, like, for a more sort of traditional company, uh, what what are the first steps in your your opinion that, that this... this uh this company should be taking, how to get started? Yeah, I think the very first step they should take is, is trying to define what, what constitutes a great experience with their product. So, so taking their most valuable customers and trying to really understand how to, what value do those most valuable customers get from the product? What is the benefit? What is the experience? And then, then the goal becomes, how do I get a lot more a lot more future customers to that experience and to that level of engagement with the product. And that's where this right metric comes into play. So if you can come up with a North Star metric around, around that experience, so you come up with something that quantifies how much of that great experience are we delivering over time? You can grow that by adding more customers, or you can grow that by 
adding more engagement to existing customers or value for existing customers. But when you, when you focus on expanding the footprint of value that you're delivering, what you, what you have long-term is, is engaged, retained, happy customers who are also telling other people about the product. And if you can grow that, that value curve in a consistent, sustainable way, you can grow revenue in a consistent, sustainable way. But when you start to grow revenue at a faster pace than you're growing the amount of value you're delivering, there's a good chance that that revenue is going to flatten out or eventually start to drop. And so that's, that would be my starting point is just trying to define, trying to define what is a great valuable experience with the product. And then how do we come up with a metric where everyone in the business understands that metric and is working to grow that metric. And then from there, you start thinking about what, how can we experiment to accelerate that metric? But if you, if you start with the experimentation and you don't have a common definition of what success looks like, then, then I think you get a lot of uh, disagreement on, oh, well, we have more leads, but they're lower quality, or you know, the, the, the customers just uh, aren't as happy, or revenue's not growing as fast as if we, if we drop a trial and just put people right into a product, you know, or wh- whatever kind of dis- dis- discussions and decisions you're making, if you can focus on ultimately, what are the tests that lead to more value delivered? Then there's a good chance you're going to be driving sustainable growth in your business. Yeah, I think I think you nailed it with the starting with the most valuable and existing customers because it's at least I've seen too often that the first thing is to start acquiring new customers and and yeah. uh, you know when you actually start digging digging with the data, they they might be really valuable leads uh, or existing clients who might be willing to buy more or acquire their their friends or peers and and so on. So yeah. that's uh, that's definitely something to start with. Yeah, and I'll give you a quick example from my time at Log Me In. When um, we initially started to grow the business, I was smartly constrained by I, mean, I couldn't spend money that I didn't see a positive return on investment on. So that made sense, right? I'm, I, if I'm going to lose money on the money I'm spending to acquire customers, um, that we're going to run out of money pretty quickly. And so I could only spend about ten thousand dollars a month. Before, when I try to spend eleven thousand or twenty thousand, I w- I would lose those additional dollars, and so um, I was constrained at about ten thousand dollars a month. But what I found is that ninety five percent of the people who were signing up for the product never used it. So I'm spending this money, and the majority of people who sign up aren't using the product. So that's that's really capping my return on investment. So instead, you know, focusing okay, these are the most valuable customers. And majority of them don't look anything like them because they're not even using the product. So what my CEO you know, was pushing me to be able to spend more money, but I said, okay, we've got this, this breakage. And so he, I was hoping maybe I'd get one product person to help with trying to get the, uh, that, that new customer onboarding, get those new customers to actually use the product. But he, he to his credit, he actually said, we're going to put a complete freeze on the product roadmap. And, and product development, and everyone on the team, engineering, design, product, and marketing are going to work together to increase the number of people who sign up, who actually use the product. And in about uh, four months, we were able to increase the sign up to usage rate by a thousand percent. And so now we had about 50% of our customers who actually signed up and used the product. And we saw a massive return on investment then because you know if they if they used it they were much more likely to buy it much more likely to tell their friends about it and it was at that point that we saw the hockey stick in the business and now when i went back and focused on scaling customer acquisition i could easily spend a million dollars a month with a very fast payback on the exact same things i'd previously tested but but now they worked because we had a lot more efficiency in actually getting people to a valuable experience so I think that's one of the key things here is that it's not customer acquisition is not bad. It's just that it's all interdependent. And if you have breakage at any point in that customer journey, it's going to stop you from being able to monetize, being able to retain, being able to drive referral and, and ultimately being able to effectively acquire new customers. One thing I still wanted to ask is uh, <clears throat> you've been saying many times that you need, uh, you know, uh, crowd-driven company, the whole company, the whole team is, is engaged with the crowd. So how do you actually, what, what is the, you know, secret success of building a successful crowd 
culture and, and, and team? How, how do you see? <laughs> well, again, I, I in, a, in a big company, I'm still trying to figure that out. And I'm, I'm, ho yeah. I'm hoping I can. <laughs> We are too. <laughs> I have, I've worked with some big companies. And I think we've made some good progress there. But what I can tell you is like with Dropbox, that was one of the things we very specifically set out to do. And um, but there was only 10 people there when I was there. So it's much, much easier. So what what I did was, you know, I, I ex exactly a lot of the stuff we've talked about. I implemented the tracking I ran surveys almost every day to try to understand where we were losing customers and why we were losing them and who our most valuable customers were and how we replicate that experience. And based on that, I came up with about 10 ideas for good experiments to run and If I had just gone now to the engineers, because everyone else on the team was an engineer at that point, if I had just gone to them and said, implement these experiments, they would have said, no way, get out of my face, marketer guy. <laughs> but, uh, but that's why I, I worked with Drew, the CEO, to, to actually get the experiments implemented. So then when CEO says, please implement this experiment, then people are going to be much more likely to do it. So we pretty quickly saw, as we implemented these experiments, an improvement in the results and you know most most engineers are pretty math driven so it didn't didn't take long for them to realize that each one of these experiments i shared the results shared what worked and what didn't work and how it impacted the growth rate and by the time we got through those first 10 experiments every engineer was excited about growth and i was i was with dropbox for a six month interim vp marketing role and by the time i finished it Every single experiment idea was coming from the engineering team. They were implementing the experiments, and it was another nine months before the next marketer joined the team. And and you know that that became part of the culture. Dropbox is the fastest company to reach the one billion dollar revenue run rate for a for a software as a service company. And uh, and their uh, worldwide head of digital marketing last year, I interviewed her at the Growth Hackers conference, and she said, "What sets Dropbox apart is everyone takes ownership of growth." So. They are that thousands of people, or yeah, thousands of people at that at the company now, where it has this growth culture. But it was super deliberative in the beginning with that we that we focused on how do we figure out the right experiments to create that culture of growth and experimentation, and 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 make that catch in the organization when it was still possible. I think you know we have seen quite successful cases in in more like this bigger company context uh, when when you just focus on starting with a small growth team and, and making everything really transparent. So you have a ba one backlog of marketing experiments or product development experiments and or that drive better conversion and, and, and so on. So, you know, task for developers, marketers, designers, wh whatever toolbox they're using, but everyone drives towards growth. And, and yeah. when you actually start making this public in the, in the bigger, bigger organization, you start doing demos. Uh, every week, every second week, you actually show from the day that, that this is what we tried, this worked, this didn't, and then you actually start showing progress, while, you know, one one step at at a time, and yep. and that's actually how to get the rest of the organization uh, engaged. So, of course, this needs from the in-house <laughs> in-house capabilities. You cannot outsource the sure. growth team uh, completely. So 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 you need some strong leader who is also also. Uh, You know, sometimes you need to piss off people in the organization, and and and, and not everyone likes that. But uh, but if you start uh, get this working, uh, we've seen also this working uh, in a bigger organizations. Yeah, I, I completely agree, and I think that's where you know what I've found is if you take that growth team who who's going to execute and communicate transparently through through the rest of the organization what's working and what's not working, and uh, and then if you can at the same time work on educating the rest of the organization about how growth works. And at least, even if they're not participating, hopefully they're not blocking. And so what I, something that I found actually that works really well in that, that scenario is um, I do an all-day growth workshop, sometimes directly with companies. I've done it with the most valuable company in the world, and I've done it with smaller companies. And then, but but I've also done it with with groups of, you know, five or 10 companies at the same time. But being able to really to really educate everyone around how growth works and, and making a decision around what their North Star metrics should be 
and you know where those high leverage opportunities are, and then having a growth team actually start on the execution of those opportunities and doing exactly as you said, just transparently communicating those more broadly uh, can can really help to uh, can help to 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 get everybody on board. But I think uh, you know there, there's a lot that needs to go right before you you know, can can retrofit the type of culture that a Facebook has has grown from from the ground up. But uh, but I, I think it's a it's a necessity for really all companies to strive for it because you know if they if they don't get there you're going to see the same thing that's happening across the entertainment area the, the online retailing like all of these different sectors the startups who who've built that culture of growth and experimentation are are taking over and dominating in those spaces and so it, it's it's only a matter of time before companies are going to be forced to try to replicate it. And, uh, and so, but I think it's still an opportunity right now where, where companies can get in front of it and, and dig in and try to figure it out before. So that, so that's an advantage rather than just a way to keep up. Yeah, I actually, actually see that uh, a lot of industries like uh, where, where the, uh, most of the sales already goes through digital funnels, like, you know, banking and financial services and electricity co- companies and telecom providers and so on. So, you know, Customers expect to buy these services online already, so that those are the ones that uh, probably have, you know, biggest urgency to change yep. change this. Absolutely, fantastic. Sean, could we just squeeze in one very quick question? I know we're pretty much sure. out of time. You'll be in Finland next month on the seventeenth of May, giving a keynote yep. talk at Columbia Road's Growth Forum event. Could you yep. just tell us a little bit what you're going to be talking about? You know, we're really going to be expanding on a lot of what, what, what we've talked about here on the on the um, podcast today. It's uh, yeah, how to you know why you should be uh, using a growth hacking approach in your business, and then how to go about really uh, implementing the the approach and and building the culture that will lead to long term sustainable growth in the business. And so, hopefully, hopefully, it's a, it's a good opportunity for for companies to bring in teammates to to really try to get alignment around what needs to be done to uh, make a high impact in on customers and and sustainably grow their business fantastic thank you very much sean thank you thank you guys